Sorry. Great. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So um, I am very happy to be here with Professor Emily Oster, who is insisting that we all call her Emily. Um, she's a professor of economics at Brown, and um, how I came to know her and how a lot of people have come to know her is she has applied her thinking in economics and econometrics about data and uncertainty and risk and kind of making sense of a complex mess to parenting. Um, and she has two really amazing books. Um, one is Expecting Better about pregnancy and prenatal care. The other is Crib Sheet about being a parent of a young child and kind of getting, kind of finding your feet and finding, kind of figuring out how to make sense of all the advice of experts. Um, I found, um, my wife and I found when we became parents that um, there were a lot of kind of, there was a lot of uncertainty and there was also a lot of strictures, like different people told us to do different things, like breastfeeding is good and sleeping on your tummy is bad. And, um, and even for the things that we thought made sense, it was hard for us to make sense of it. It was hard for us to kind of understand the reasoning behind it and um, apply it to our situation and, and make judgments about it. And that is the thing that um, Emily Oster really is excellent at. She has recently turned her thinking towards um, COVID and the pandemic. Um, and we're kind of here to bring all of that together um, to talk about COVID, the pandemic, the uncertainty around it, the uncertainty around the pandemic and kids, and kind of really how to think through some of these issues. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I'm excited too. Um, so, um, um, I think I, 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 I'm a big picture guy, so I want to start with the big picture. So how do you think about, I mean, the pandemic and in, in terms of like in relationship to parenting, the level of uncertainty, the level of new information that you get all the time every week in the news, there's something else about um, we're learning about how the pandemic works and affects people. There's something else about how we're learning the pandemic affects kids. Like how do you kind of impose order on that and navigate it? Yeah, so somebody asked me the other day, I thought this was very insightful. They were like, hey, doesn't this feel a little bit like kind of er like early parenting where it's sort of like every day there's like something new and different and something you didn't think about and and it's like, oh my God, the, the poop is a weird color. Wait, I never thought that it could be that color and like I have to like immediately figure figure that out. And so, I and I, I think that's sort of like, panic is, is the wrong word, but like there is a little bit of a sort of like, like a hyper panic that that goes on and so i think that there's um so somebody said isn't it a little doesn't it feel a little bit like that um i think in some ways it does feel a little bit like that it's sort of like every day there's some new information or some new consideration there's the new scary story or a new reassuring story and we're sort of like whiplashing between you know like this terrifying thing and then this like reassure oh there's going to be a vaccine there's going to be a you know oh now like kids are really heavily affected oh no they're not and so i think that part is that part is hard. I think what you know what is different, and in fact, what's what's for me been the most challenging about sort of navigating this. Maybe there's two things that have been the most challenging. So one is, you know, when you're a new when you are a new parent, um, you can look out at the world and realize that other people have have like done this before, and that they are going to come out like that. People come out on the other end. You know, like you see the person with the four year old, and it's like, yeah, okay, like you know, this may be really hard, but at the end of the day, like the kids are going to poop in the potty and put on their own jacket. And like, that's that. And like many people have gotten there and I can get there too. And I think part of what's hard about this is like, when you're sort of like, okay, let me look to like who got, well, nobody's gotten through the global pandemic right now. And so I don't like, I'm, I, it feels like, well, what is it just like forever? Are we like never going to, um, to get out? And I think that that's, that's sort of really, that's scary in like a different that's scary in, in a different um, in a different way. I think that's one thing that's really hard. Um, Finn, I am on a webinar. Okay, thank you for my phone. Goodbye. Um, the other thing that's really hard is that we're all parenting at the same time that we're working. Close the door, Finn. Yes, close the door. Thank you. That was very well. That was very well timed. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not the only other thing. Um, I think the other thing is that the data is really not, even relative to some of the problematic data in parenting and, and pregnancy, the data here is, is really incomplete. There's just like a lot of questions that we would like to know the answer to that we don't, we don't know anything about. Like the question of, you know, how risky is this for kids? How risky is it for old people? Like, we just don't, like, we just basically have no idea. Um, and grappling with that, that kind of uncertainty, like the just such extreme amounts of uncertainty, I think that's really, um, I think that's that's really hard, and that's the piece that I've been 
you know, spending a lot of time trying to think about, you know, how can we help, how can I help people think about how to structure decisions in the face of like so much uncertainty, so much more uncertainty than there is in these other spaces that I've thought about before. Yeah. I mean, is it the same basic approach? Like, you know, um, like, I mean, what does that look like to kind of navigate that intense level of uncertainty, the novelty of it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's some, it's, it is the same basic approach in the sense that I think in all of these places, you need to sort of say what you're trying to decide and sort of think about what is the choice that I'm making and think about, you know, what are the risks, what are the benefits, and then, you know, try to move, try to move forward. Um, I think it's, it's just, it's heightened in the sense that you have to recognize that when you get to these kind of these that when you start to think about like how do i evaluate the risk i am just so much more limited in what i can know there and there's so much more of just i'm gonna have to say i'm gonna make this choice and i'm gonna know that i don't know if it's the right choice i mean some people i mean the way that a lot of people are responding to this um people that i mean and i don't think this is unreasonable um is um Look, there's a lot of uncertainty. The thing to do is just to be as cautious as possible, right? To kind of like shut, to like isolate ourselves. To, you know, my kid's not going to school. They're not having friends over. Um, grandparents aren't visiting. Like, I don't want to get this. I don't want my kids to get it. Like, you know, I'll wait until we know more. If not, wait till a vaccine. At least wait until we know more. Um, like, how do you, I mean? How do you think about that kind of response? Is it like reasonable for some people? Like, you know, is there more nuance to it than that? Um, I mean, I think that kind of response is reasonable. For some, for some people, but I think what, you know, and I think it made a lot of sense at the beginning, in some sense, like it was where we all were like six weeks ago, right? Like, okay, we're just gonna like stay in our houses and, and, and isolate. But I, I think that the thing that we have sort of realized people ask me the question, like, should I send my kid back to daycare? It feels like, okay, well, there's this sort of default, which is just no, like, no, no, because it's like not, it's not the safest, it's not the safest thing. But there are a lot of, considerations on the other side and I think as this has gone on for for longer we've both realized that it isn't clear what the alternative is right. like you know are you going to like it, it would be one thing to say I'm going to wait for a vaccine which at least is a very concrete thing although it is 18 months off right you know 12 to 18 months off so I mean maybe it's less than that but like let's say it's something like that and mm -hmm. so so are but if you're not willing to do that you know then it's not clear why now is different from a month from now or two months from now. And maybe it is, but I think at least we need to be articulating the ways in which it's different. So when I think about, I'm gonna choose whether to do this now or do it in two months, well, is there something you're expecting to be different in two months or do two months just feel like, well, that's like later. Like, I don't wanna decide. I'm just gonna decide later. Who is yeah. Huh? I mean, do you, feel, do you feel like we're learning more? Like, I mean, uh, like what we know now compared to what we know two months ago, um, there's more yeah. data, you know, um, there, there's kind of more evidence, there's more experience across different countries. Like, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, part of what I hear is like, look, we just don't understand this thing yet. Like, and so I think kind of part of what people are waiting for is for the certainty to shrink. Right. And, but I think I, you know, I'm not sure how quickly we really think it's going to shrink. So if you think mm -hmm. about some of the, un, you know, yes, of course we are learning more things and I think we will know more in, in two months. Um, than we do now, the, but some of the things you would hope to learn about and the people have said, well, what if there are like really long-term impacts? You know, what if right. like it, the disease is mild in kids now, but you know, we see impacts on them, you know, 10, 15 years later. Okay, well, that could be, but we're not gonna resolve that uncertainty in six months. You know, I also think we now know enough that, you know, it, it is very unlikely at this point that we're gonna find that kids are like a very heavily affected group given everything we've seen. You know, we, maybe we'll learn more about the, the details. We will learn more about the details of you know, exactly how large are the risks and so on. But the sort of basic things about like which age groups are more at risk, we are not going to, we have already learned quite a lot about that. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you, that people wouldn't say, well, here is a piece of information I'm waiting for. Like, I need to know this. And I think we'll learn this. I think that's reasonable. But again, I think it would be useful from a decision standpoint to really articulate what, what is that piece of data what makes you think that you're going to learn it in the next, you know, two months and then, you know, use that in decision making. I think that's kind of the key. That's, that's the sort of key decision making principle in a sense. Yeah. I no, guess that makes, the other thing I would sense. say, Matt, is I think it's worth thinking, particularly around things like kids, but even around like adult stuff, 
you know, people tend to frame this like somehow the safest thing to do is to, is to stay home. And that comes up both in policy and in, right, we still talk about like opening schools in general. They'll say, well, the safest thing to do is to leave, you know, the safest thing to do is to keep all the schools closed. Um, because, you know, if we open schools, some people will get infected, which is for sure true. When we open, when we reopen schools, some people will get COVID. That is, maybe it's not a lot of people, but some people will. It's just like, it's a disease. We're yep, in the middle yep. of a pandemic. It's going to happen. Yep. At the same time, like one in five kids is like hungry because they're not getting school meals. And, you know, the school lunch program feeds 30 million kids in the U.S. And a lot of those kids are not eating enough. So that's not, that's not free either. You know, that's not like, that, that's not nothing. Yep. Yep. I mean, so part of this is kind of com like part of the framing is like comparative risks. It's like, what are the actual alternatives and what are the costs and benefits of each? And um, a friend of mine had this quip the other day. It's like, look, everything looks terrible if you just do, a, or everything looks great if you do a benefits analysis and everything looks terrible if you do a cost analysis. And, um, and like, there's some of that going on um, here. Um, hang on, before I get to this question, I just want to um, say something that I forgot to say. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Emily some questions for a little while and we'll chat and then I'm going to start funneling questions from you guys in the chat um, to her. So um, do be posting your questions in the chat. I'll be reading them. Um, so um, um, yeah, like, like what, you know, so let me go back to something that you said a, a couple of minutes ago. You said that we already know a fair bit about kids being less at risk. Can you just, I mean, if, say a little bit more about that and especially in the context of like I don't think that everybody thinks that fully like I think that there there is still you know um the Kawasaki syndrome or um you know schools open in France and then they had to close again or um there's kind of things coming up that um are kind of widely talked about and reported on like how, how do you kind of parse those things and make sense of them um in light of that kind of general judgment that like yes the younger you are the less at risk you are so I think the first thing to say is like we generally think about respiratory illnesses like this, like if you sort of looked at something like the flu and you looked at like the age pattern of like who gets the flu, um, for something like the flu, kids actually get the flu. It's like kids and old people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like the, the curve. I don't know if it's like, I'm yeah. not going to be able to draw the curve. The curve is like sort of high, low, high, right? Yeah. Um, and so that I think when we, if you sort of say like, where would you have started in terms of COVID? Like what would you have expected? You would have expected kids to get this basically more than prime age adults if it were operating like something like the seasonal flu. Um, but instead we see basically just a linear, like a linear increase. Um, you know, maybe infants are like slightly more likely, like at risk than older kids. Infants are always kind of more at risk for, for stuff, but like, you know, sort of there's really more or less a kind of like linear, like not linear, it goes, goes like that, but a, a monotonic, uh, a monotonic increase in the risk yep. as people, as people age. And so I think that is, that was surprising. Um, yeah. And it's also useful to say, because when people talk about this, they sort of talk about it as if like in the absence, like for most diseases, kids are not at risk at all, which is like not, not, not yeah. um, so, 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 so part of the, so part of the point here is just like, look, like we have priors about how diseases affect people and that like we would expect like a bimodal distribution and we don't see that. And like that in and of itself is like, yeah. significant data point. Yeah. yeah, and it also means like, you know, when you make choices about sending your kid to school in the middle of flu season, which you are doing almost certainly, like you are taking a risk that they get the they get the flu. And you know, that could be that could be very serious. And so when I think that that kind of like framing inside the existing risks, I think is is important. I think some of this discussion has become like we need to get the risk to zero without recognizing that like the risk of disease is never at zero. That's it, diseases are are a thing. Um, so, so kids tend to be sort of relatively low, uh, relatively low risk. They, not a lot of them get the disease or have not been a lot of deaths um, or hospitalizations. The hospitalization rate is low. The death rate is extremely low. Um, it's not zero, but, and that is tragic, but it is very, very low. Um, and kids generally seem to have a fairly mild course. There's just a lot of asymptomatic infection um, in kids, which is a sort of problem for transmission, transmission, but, um, but sort of less less bad for um less bad for for kids there are these examples so this kawasaki thing has come up um has come up a lot and you know i yeah. spent a lot of time talking to, to pediatricians about that and you know it does seem like that is a that is a complication that comes up in other viral we think is associated with other viral illnesses or sort of versions of that um versions of this kind of uh this kind of syndrome uh it does seem like it may be linked um with uh with covid i think it's not completely clear because a lot of the cases actually 
the kids didn't have um, didn't have COVID, uh, but you know probably it does have some it does have some some link. But these numbers are really small, and I think that's the kind of like the thing to sort of separate is like what that tells you is like kids can get very sick, and it is something to be aware of. On the other hand, it is not the same as saying many kids get very sick. That is something for which you need to look at the overall data, and the overall data suggests that most kids who have this have very mild risks. Yeah, I mean, one of the points that um, I was talking to um, Dr. Ajala a couple of weeks ago about this, and one of the points that he made is that, look, in some ways there's there's not enough data, and we don't know enough, and in some ways there's this overwhelming amount of data because like it's this intense focus on this globally, and there's millions of cases, and and so like th there's a way that like you might see some of, you know, like it might be that like other kinds of coronaviruses or respiratory illnesses cause Kawasaki syndrome in children and like it hasn't been that well documented or, um, or you know, like, like it doesn't, like that there's a kind of like, um, there's, there's some sort of, I don't know what it is, it's not quite a selection bias. Salience, there, it's yeah. like salience or attention. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I mean, how, like, I mean, it, I mean, when I read the news, like it seems like it's more, it's less about like how many people are really getting this and what's the risk and more about like there's a new terrible thing and yeah. um i mean should you just like how do you just, just like look you have to kind of force yourself to take that in context or yeah i think you have to try to force yourself to take it in, in context i mean i always think about like if every time you know somebody like if if every time there was a a kid a kid died with drowning you know and that if that was covered with the same attention uh people would not have schools uh, and so, you know, we're like, we're not really, um, you know, we're, we're kind of giving a lot of attention to this for good reason, of course, but it is also, um, it is also worth saying like that amount of attention is affecting and, and particularly because the attention like tends to be on sort of bad outcomes, you know, there aren't a lot of studies, which there aren't a lot of newspaper articles that are just like, Here's this person who got the coronavirus and then how many symptoms. Here's this other person. This is not a very interesting article. And so we have sort of like, right. there's a, which is not to say that this isn't problematic. Like I think sometimes people have sort of gotten it like, oh, you're right. Like, who cares? Like, it's no big deal. It, it is a big deal. It is bad. Um, and, but, you know, we have to, we have to kind of balance our attention. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, part of the challenge is um, how new this is, how politicized it is, how, um, yeah. Like when you when you want to do things like, okay, like let me compare this in thinking about my child to the flu, like immediately, like you're going to have people. Like, oh, are you like throat. a right wing? Oh, you're yeah, like exactly. a right wing nut job. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like this isn't just the flu. And it's like, well, like, well, the flu does have risks. And like, how do you think about it? And, um, right. And it isn't you know. just the flu in the sense that right. like the, you know, the mortality rate for elderly, for older people right. is way, way higher than it is yep. for the, for the flu. Yeah. I mean. Right. I mean, in a, I mean, in New York, it's been very, very serious for, for the elderly yeah. in particular. Um, I have a kind of, the, I want to take this question here because it's relevant from Erin Ornalo. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, she's asking about how to, how to think about these decisions in the context of the kind of heightened risk sensitivity that you're going to have with your children. Like, like it's your child, like, yeah, yeah, you can talk about in general, like, you know, children have a certain risk profile, but it's like my child. Um, it's the kind of most precious thing in the world to me. Is there some way that you can kind of frame this to yourself to kind of like think think it through in a clear way? Um, so I, I guess I, you know, I would say I, I, the first time I really thought about that was in the context of something like SPIDS, right? So so when you sort of think about things like bed sharing or choices that you make around, around sleep with, with an infant, making those choices in a thoughtful way actually does require you to contemplate like some really worst case scenario and part of what's really hard about being a parent is the realization that like if something bad happens to to your kid I mean that is like there is there is nothing that could, like that is your whole that's your whole life you know there isn't anything else that is close to that and so so but on the other hand you know you kind of have to make these choices um and uh you know, you have you have to make these choices, and so I, I think one one way I would I would put it is to just try to put it in the context of risks that you obviously are are comfortable taking, in like because they they have other benefits. So you put your kids in the car, um, and you do that because maybe uh, you live in New York, and have a car, but I have a car. A lot of people have a car. Put your kids in the car. You drive around with them in in the car, even though you know it has risks, because there are some benefits to driving around in the car. 
you send your kid to school, uh, you know, even though you know there are risks because it's good for them to, to go to school and interact with other people. So, you know, you are taking some of these risks. We want to think about this risk magnitude wise in the context of those other risks and recognize that you must have some risk tolerance for, for the worst case outcome because you are making these other choices. And I think that's, that's kind of one way that, you know, it's yep. not an easy conversation or it's in an easy frame, but. Yep. Yep. No, I mean, my wife and I have had that conversation about since many times. We have a child who really strongly prefers to sleep on her stomach. Um, but I mean, we kind of work yeah. through it, but like, it is like, oh, that is the kind of riskiest thing you can do. And you have to contemplate that. Um, um, okay. Um, so in terms of, um, let's talk kind of more specifically about the risks. So um, like what are like, there's a, so children in general, are at lower risks? Like, are there specific things that you should be alert about as a parent? Like for your, you know, whether it's older people in your household, is it, is it a different, like what if you're pregnant? What if you've got a young kid? Like what, what are the kinds yeah. of things? That, and, and then location too, like we have schools across the country, across the world even. Um, I was saying earlier, um, you know, 48 of our schools are opening at limited capacity um, next week. So, or sorry, schools in 48 states are opening at limited capacity um, next week. Like, how do you think about this if you're in New York versus Texas versus, um, is that something to consider? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think all of these things are kind of part of where if I were saying like, I'm gonna make this choice for, you know, for myself, these are all kind of pieces that I would, um, that, you know, that I would think about. So I think that, you know, within the range of kids, kind of the, the, in some sense, the younger the kid after maybe, maybe is a little bit higher up below a year, but kind of the younger the kid, the lower, um, the lower the serious complication risk, like these kind of serious complications, like the sort of Kawasaki cell, what we're calling it, like NISC or PMI, people have called it different things, but this like inflammatory syndrome. Um, this is this is something which you would know if your kid was having, like the symptoms, just want to be clear, like the symptoms of this are like five days of a very high fever with like lethargy. And you know, this is like a very serious illness. This is, this is something where if your kid is experiencing these symptoms, you would be taking them to the doctor. Um, for sure. So like if you say sort of, you should be on the lookout for that, but you should always kind of be on the lookout for that. If your kid is really sick, yep. Yep. You, know, you should take them to the pediatrician. Um, I think there's a lot of intra-household stuff that's probably relevant here. So like if you, if your kid lives with, if you live with your kid and your elderly parents, that is a very different situation than if you live with your kid without your elderly parents. Um, if you, you know, live with your kid and you're, you know, and there's, there's a, you know, immune compromised infant in the house, that again is a, is a different thing. Um, pregnant women actually don't seem to be any more heavily affected than other women in their age group. And it's a, you know, relatively low risk, um, low risk age group. So the sort of specific thing of being pregnant is probably itself not a, um, you know, not a, not a reason to do something, to do something different. Um, so there are prenatal you know, risks for your child, I assume. They're sorry. I assume if you're saying that, that your view is there aren't kind of serious prenatal risks for the child. The data mostly there suggests no, actually, even, even from COVID positive moms, the transmission rate to, to infants is actually not that high. Um, even if you're not, you know, they, there's some ambiguity about whether it can be transmitted in utero, but even if you sort of look at this small sample of like women we see and they have COVID at the time of birth, they give birth, only a relatively small share of their of their infants get any evidence of infection and they generally don't get sick. Yep, yep. I mean, and how, like, what do you think about this differently? So we, I just got a question actually from, as I was saying that from Hannah Eisenberg, we live in the epicenter, New York City. Um, we're using distance learning programs. They're using some, this was from one of our parents. Um, you know, um, she, she actually has some questions about kind of recommendations for social life, but like, do you think about this differently if you're living in New York? Of course. I mean, I think that like, it would be, you know, there, New York is a very, is a, is unusual. Um, and there are you know, a few other areas with, but New York being the most heavily yep. affected. Yeah. And the risks are just higher. Like more people have this, more people are going to have it for, you know, a substantial period of, of time. If you're living in the middle of, you know, in the middle of Iowa or Oklahoma or somewhere, you know, it's not that your kid couldn't get it. Every place there is, you know, there is spread, but the rates are really, the rates are really low. Uh, and so your risks are going to be correspondingly, correspondingly lower. So when you're thinking about um, school, 
Um, I mean, this is what most of the questions in the chat are about. And you're thinking about the kind of benefits of school, like, you know, the social contact, the learning, the, um, the kind of general, the reasons why we send our children to school. Like, how do you weigh something like that against the risk of illness, which it seems like a kind of, it's like not even apples to oranges. Right. It's like, you yeah. know, kiwi to like clouds, like, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like, it's super hard because what, like the social benefits seem so nebulous and like long and long term. Um, and this, and the disease seems like very, like the idea of them being sick, it seems like very immediate. And, you know, particularly if there's a risk of them getting very sick, like, you know, but, um, but I, you know, I, I guess I, I, I it's hard to put data on that. You could sort of look at data, like kids kids are more anxious, like a ton of stuff happening with like, sort of like anxiety and mental health stuff with um, with kids, you know, even, you know, fairly fairly young kids. Um, they're just, they don't like to be isolated like yeah. this. I mean, I think it really is the social contact. That's the other thing I've realized through this. And then I sort of struggled to try to, to, bring, to bring evidence or think about what is the evidence that at least, you know, for, for at least some share of kids, the learning piece of this is not such a, I mean, there are ways you can have a nine-year-old learn online. It's not ideal. It isn't probably the way we would set up our school, but, you know, it has some benefits. It has some costs, whatever. But the, the social stuff is just really hard to replicate on, really hard to replicate online. Um, and, you know, I can see that my kids miss just like seeing other kids and learning how to interact with, you know, learning, like the part of the school that's learning about how to interact with other people. That's yeah. Um, that's a big deal. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's hard to weigh. Yeah, I mean, it's a major part of every early childhood program. It's certainly like yeah. a big deal in our schools. Like we make a big deal out of social education and mixed stages and kind of getting people together and seeing different things. And, um, um, you know, we're kind of making all of these arguments about the importance of um, socializing your child in a certain way. And, um, and then it's like, you know, stay at home. Like we're going to do distance learning. It's very hard. It's, it's kind of very hard to weigh. Um, I think it's part of what has been so hard, like the sort of different age groups, like are are some age groups are harder are harder than others. Yeah, I think high I school think students is probably a bit, you know, like they're probably kind of bored, but like at least the learning piece. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's a kind of toddler to early elementary zone that's um, pretty difficult. It's like you know, I mean, Alice, who's three months old, she's okay with just us for now. Um, right. um, but. Um, but, um, you know, and it's also harder to explain to young children. I mean, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about, like, how, like, how do you talk to your kids about this? Like, I mean, especially if you've got a sensitive child or, like, you know, there's a pandemic and things are different and, like, I don't know if you have any advice about this, but. Um, I mean, I think I keep thinking about sort of, like, titrating to your particular kid. So a lot of the advice that I've, I've seen is sort of, like, this is what's good for this age and this is what's good for this age. But actually, like, particularly as kids are, old, like, so my, my nine-year-old is like, like fairly into facts. And so the way that we dealt with this particularly early on was I would just like tell her like things about how like how the pandemic was evolving over my life, which is like a really weird set of things to be interacting with a nine-year-old about to be like, okay, you know, this is like the hospitalization rate and this is how we're thinking about modeling the epidemic. But that for her, like, you know, she's my kid, like, like that was a sort of way to, to exercise some control, like through understanding, which of course is super super surprising but my five-year-old we've just been like stay away from people and he and he'll be like you know like he had some idea about things that were distancing because of the corona like you know he sort of like just got the idea that like the coronavirus means that you're distancing and that's you know that's what it is and i think a lot of kids of that age settle on that it's like you know can we go to Chuck E. Cheese? Oh no, of course we can't because of the coronavirus, right? And, and the it's coronavirus, like, they don't, right. yeah, they don't get it, but like they they get that this is a kind of new chain. They get that the idea that they can't do things, right? That yeah. they understand. Can't go to yeah. the bounce place. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean I think I mean the like for children that can understand this um, in a, in a kind of close to it. I mean it sounds like your nine year old daughter like has a grasp on it. Like I mean understanding is um, understanding is. Um, understanding is control, understanding is kind of, it lets you kind of impose order on the universe. Um, I think that like the challenge is like for children who basically understand this at the level of like my routine is disrupted, right? Um, and, and for young children, that's really hard. Um, oh, you're muted. How do we unmute you? Unmute. Oh no. 
Okay, wait, sorry. I muted because Penelope came in to start doing oh. math. <laughs> but, um, but now I'm back because she's going in the closet to do her math. Um, is that your daughter? Yeah, that's my daughter. Penelope, you want to wave hello? Hi. Hi, Penelope. Um, she's a coronavirus modeling savant. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna go watch some Khan Academy in the closet. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's amazing. Um, so, um, in, in terms of, um, so there's kind of like, how do you think about the risk factors? How do, how do I think about kind of differentially how it applies to me? And then there's also like, is there a way to mitigate it? So like, you know, when you're thinking about something like school or the playground or outdoor play or socializing, like there's social distancing practices, like, but, but you know, especially when you're thinking about school, um, are there effective mitigation strategies? You know, what do we know? Like, are there countries that have opened their schools? Like, what are they doing? You know, um, like what, what should we expect to see there? Yeah, so I think, you know, one thing is like, it's probably, I think part of what will be useful as we start to do this is to recognize that like, uh, you know, this isn't like, there is no perfect mitigation, right? And so you sort of brought up this thing about in France, like they reopened schools and then like some kids, you know, some people got, got the virus. That's gonna happen. You know, when we reopen schools, there are gonna be people who get the virus. And if we're sort of reopening with some idea that like that's, that we're not gonna get any of that, it's gonna be a, like a rude awakening. Um, so I think we want to sort of get to a point where like we're protecting the most vulnerable populations older people, et cetera, and you know, immune compromised people, and where we are, um, where we are like trying to lower the risk as much as, as possible. And so I think that, you know, the key things there are like hand washing, right? If you think about how the virus works, like gets on your hands and then you touch your face. And if you don't touch, if you wash your hands before you touch your face, it's, it's fine. You know, you don't, you don't get sick, right. like seep in. Um, so I think, you know, there's hand washing, you know, masks, there's like some debate about the effectiveness of masks. I think asking kids to wear masks is probably very hard to accomplish. Um, yeah. It could make things worse if they spend a lot of time touching their masks. So I think that's a little challenging. You know, I would have said in some ways, probably the biggest thing that schools are going to want to do is, um, is be really, really strict on illness and just say, basically, if your kid is at all sick, you don't come in. And, you know, I think, right, like, I feel like in this sort of pre-COVID thing, it was like, well, their fever's like 99.9, and it's not 100.4, so I'm, you know, I'm sending them in, right? And like, you know, and I think that we're, we're kind of all going to have to, or, the, you know, they have a runny nose, but they don't have a fever. I think we're sort of all going to have to adapt to, like, basically, your kid goes to school if they're, like, straight up healthy, and they don't go to school um, if they are at all sick. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if we can get to a place where people are kind of like operating like that, that's, that's really going to limit it. That yep. will really yep. limit things. I mean, yeah. does, I mean, and I mean, our kind of normal policy would be like, if you show any signs of illness or fever, um, you stay home until you don't for 24 hours. Like, is that, right. is it like now it's like yeah. a week or, you know, no, you know. I would have said, I mean, I think, you know, maybe, maybe you extend it to, to two days or something, you know, and, and probably that's going to need to titrate a little bit. Um, and the other thing is like, you know, I'm hoping that our testing infrastructure will improve. So, you know, by the time this is going to help if you're opening schools on Monday, but like by the time, you know, people get to back to like, you know, August, and September, you know, there's a kind of, if you believe the most optimistic testing people, you're going to be able to get an antigen test that processes in 15 minutes with saliva. And we'll be, you know, we'll have millions of, you know, 50 million doses of that a day. And, yeah. and so in that world, it's like, as soon as you're sick, you get a test. If you don't have COVID, you're fine. If you, you know, you do the regular thing, if you do have COVID, you know, you're out for until you get to a negative test, whatever it is. So, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, that's the that's dream. That's like the dream, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. We're not South Korea, so I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. Um, and I think it's probably going to, um, I think there's probably going to be some unevenness about it. Um, we have been talking to like particular medical researchers and particular organizations who are like looking to pilot things and looking to try things. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't even know what that's going to be allowed. I don't know um, yeah. kind of um, how, you know, if it would even be even across our schools and how widespread that that would be. I mean, what do you like looking forward to fall, which is where everybody's looking who has a child? Um, and where teachers are looking, it's like, what, like, like, is there going to be a second wave? You know, are, like, how is that going to affect school openings? Is it going to be like, is there going to be a testing regimen in place? I mean, do you have 
a sense or even a sense of like what to look for? Um, I mean, I think this question of the second wave, like, you know, is something people keep bringing up, but I think we don't, I don't really know why it would, like, I, that feels to me like something where we just like have no idea. We, we have no hmm. idea. I mean, of course, there could be a, I guess there could be a second wave next week. Like there could be a second wave at any time. I don't know, like, or maybe not. Um, and so I'm not sure that, but, but I'm not sure that is, that is relevant. I think what you will see is, you know, and I've been partly because I'm, I, you know, so I work at Brown, I'm actually like one of the co-chairs of the committee to helpfully reopen Brown, it has some other name. Um, but basically we're like trying to think about how to reopen, reopen the university. And a huge piece of that here is things like testing. And so just try and figure out how can we get a good testing infrastructure in, um, in place. And so we can, um, and so, you know, we can like yeah. end up in it, like sort of safely, safely reopening. And so I think we'll see a lot of that with schools also, but I don't think it will look like, it's not gonna, I mean, September's not gonna look like last September. Yeah. I mean, you said you weren't holding your breath. So like even like for, for the cases that you know best, like Brown, where you're kind of like working at it, like, do you expect there to be some sort of testing or? Oh yes. Oh, you think there will be? I expect there to be symptomatic testing and surveillance testing. No university, not my university, not any university is gonna open without a really extensive surveillance testing program, which is gonna test asymptomatic people routinely in various ways. I mean, I imagine that that, like if that's gonna be the approach in higher ed, I imagine that that's going to be ceteris paribus analogous to kind of what you see at a different levels of school. I mean, I think the trick is that like, is that like that's expensive. Um, yep. And so, you know, if that's like, if, you know, if we're gonna do that at Brown, that's not gonna, you know, that's gonna cost money. The Providence public school yep. system is not, um, is not gonna be doing the same thing that Brown is doing at the current testing cost. Yeah, I mean, it's expensive, but also, you know, if you can compare it to like not opening school or, you know, yeah. um, it's cheap. <laughs> um, um, so um, we have somebody asking in chat um, just about the, like the, um, you know, should we expect, like, I went through a test process, it took three weeks, this seems useless for schools, like, is that kind of what we're looking at or? Um... No, I mean, I think that the testing, so the, the sort of testing infrastructure has improved a lot, even in the last, in the last few weeks. So, mm -hmm. you know, for in a few different ways. So one, the like active infection testing now, the, the, the PCRs, do not, um, right, even in the last, she's saying this is May 10th. Um, so uh, within like basically the last since then, I don't know what kind of test you had, but since then we've like moved to um, different kinds of swabbing. So we don't have to, they don't have to swab. You did the Abbott test, so the, okay, I'm like, now I'm like watching the chat. Okay, <laughs> so it's fine. Um, so the, the testing has, I think the testing has, has improved um, and, uh, and you know they sort of move to different kinds of swabs, which are easier to to self administer. The thing that people are talking about that will be like a total game changer, but may or may not happen, um, is um, is an antigen test. So that would like that works in a slightly different way, but it can be very fast because it basically just tries to detect the spike protein on the outside of the um, of the viral end of the of the pathogen, um, and that is uh, then you don't have to replicate the DNA a lot. Um, and so those can be very fast. They, the FDA has approved one. It doesn't have a great sensitivity right now, but you know, there's like 12 more under, under development. If we get there, we'll be able to do it. Those are really fast to make and they're really fast to run. So yep. you know, we'll see. I yeah, know. I mean, that would be great. I mean, that's, that's what I've been hearing too. And that's kind of what we're ex yeah. looking at experimenting with. So we will see, and then we'll also see the kind of like what's the false positive rate. And there's a lot yeah. of different- What's the false positive? What's the false negative? Like, yep. you know, Yep. Yep. Um, we have Jennifer Aguilar in the chat asking um, about, this is something we totally skipped over and should not have, asking about the transmission um, risks of children to adults, yeah. which is a big question for schools. This is like a huge open question. And so there was a thing a few weeks ago where, pe where like some people, there people wrote these articles that were like, kids can't transmit the virus. Well, who, who had that idea? That's not true. I mean, kids can definitely transmit the virus if they are sick. They can transmit the virus like anybody else can. It does, see, I think what people were referring to though, is when we have seen cases in schools, like there was a sort of a few cases in some schools in Australia, the transmission seems to be extremely limited. Um, so, you, you know, that's, um, th so if for like what, whatever reason, it seems like either, you know, one theory is kids because they're asymptomatic are not like shedding viruses as much, 
another thing is just maybe they don't get they just don't get infected as much and so if they're not infected as much schools are not like generally a, a sort of huge source of, of transmission so i think this is a place where at the moment the the probably the most reliable data would suggest that in school school transmission is not a huge issue but is possible we need to know so much more and i think as we reopen these schools in europe we were going to learn more so like the case in france is that an isolated case or is every school in france full of coronavirus now um and this is why like as you open schools you know as people open schools you've got to try to collect some data yeah i mean this is a i mean this is part of the chicken and egg issue right um i mean you know people want to know the answer to this question before they open schools um and um i think that i mean there are some places that have, so we'll have some data, but I think that, like this kind of gets back to your general framework of kind of like, okay, what do we know in general? What's reasonable to expect? Um, and, you know, how can we kind of update in, in, a, in an ongoing way? Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Sorry. Um, sorry, just a couple more questions from the chat. Um, maybe we can take one more We're running out of time. This is a very specific question, but I feel like it's something you're going to have interesting opinions on. Um, so a lot of people have been doing a lot of increased screen time with their children as a result of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, like, how do you think about the benefits and the risks of that? Is it, I mean, yeah, what's your view on that? I mean, look, I spent a lot of time in crib sheet on the question of screen time. And like, you know, I think that the data that people rely on to argue that like screen time is bad is very limited and tends to be, you know, really like sort of like use of screen time is really heavily associated with other socioeconomic risk factors. Most of the evidence we have would suggest that a sort of like adult approach to this, which is like some screen time is okay, it shouldn't be like you shouldn't only be doing screen time, um, is you know, like that something like that is probably a reasonable approach. You know, we've all been using a lot of screens, I use a lot of screens, there's no question. I mean, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately though is, you know, are there ways in this distance learning to kind of limit screens? So, for example, like my kids' school has PE on the screen, and like I know that they're trying to like help. But like, and we were just basically like, I'm sorry, like every day we're running outside, like our kids are going to go outside for like, and my daughter's going to run a 5k with us every day. That's PE. I'm not having her like watch somebody do jumping jacks as PE. Right. Like there's like a limit to like, it's great to use screen time for math if we have to, but it yep. is not something we need to do for PE. And so I think there's some, there's some kind of balance there, but my kids watch a lot of TV, honestly. Yep. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, this is an area where I think in education in particular, kind of like the, the consensus has flipped on this issue like pretty quickly. I mean, there are still people who are concerned, but um, I mean, there are still are concerns, but it's like, I mean, you know, if you had said a year ago, like, is it okay for children to be spending like five plus hours Your a day? Entire on the day. Or something? Yeah, like people would have been like, no, like you are a devil parent slash educator, like this is insane. Um, and now people are like, well, like, you know, like be thoughtful about it. it like depends on what you're doing on the screen. And like, there's all this kind of motivated nuance coming out now that everybody has to do it. Yes, exactly. Um, motivated yeah. nuance, I like that. <laughs> well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully only, <laughs> hopefully motivated at least partially by the truth. I mean, I actually think that my view is that it was kind of too, way too far on the side of like screen time is the devil and people kind of weren't yeah. like, really thinking about the issue. Um, and now it's like, exactly. well, like, I'd, I'd rather, you know, my child Skype with grandma than not talk to grandma ever, right? So, um, yeah. um, so we are coming up to the end of our time. So um, thank, thank you. So, thank you so much for joining us. This was super fun this for me. This was super, super fun. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Um, like I said at the beginning, we've got a few more webinars on this coming up. Um, Kayla can post a link to that in the chat on, um, on these issues of kind of how to think about your child, um, how to think about social distancing. Um, with the one coming up next is how to think about social distancing in an urban environment. Are you signing off? No, no, I'm I'm saying oh. hello to the baby that appeared in my video. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a baby. From Rachel, the Rachel has a baby, and it's a very cute uh, baby. Hello, baby. Uh, um, and um, that's with um, Britt Safir um, of Kin. They're doing a lot of cool things in New York City on um, kind of thinking about children and socialization in the time of the pandemic, and then. Um, Lenore Skenazi is going to talk to us about elementary children and the free time that they're going to have this summer because all camps are canceled. Um, and we have a bunch of other things like that. So um, check out our webinar series. And thank you so much again, um, Emily, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. Good luck, everybody. Stay Bye. safe. Yep. Bye.